certificate of artificiality had uh, express, uh, expressed a willingness to bet me at 100 to 1 odds that this would turn out to be an artificial object uh, built by intelligence. And uh, I uh, was in a discussion one day on the internet um, again, defending the idea that we should keep an open mind till the evidence is in. And one of the conventional astronomers spontaneously offered to bet me or anyone at 100 to 1 odds that this was a natural object. Well, no, recognizing an opportunity when I see one, <laughs> I pointed out that for every dollar I bet both ways, I'm $99 richer no matter what is the case. But this, uh, this to me was an object lesson in not letting your emotions uh, dictate uh, your views. Clearly, somebody was, um, was not being objective here, at least one of the two sides. But in December 96, uh, I was uh, on a radio program discussing uh, why Comet Hale-Bopp did not have a, a companion. Uh, and uh, the origin of comets, and I mentioned the exploded planet hypothesis and how the most recent such explosion apparently took place 3.2 million years ago. And a caller, or listener rather, uh, wrote me email, and he, uh, he said, uh, he asked a very interesting question. He said, um, if you're right about all that, um, there's this uh, area on Mars called Cydonia, and it has this famous face uh, in it. And uh, if that thing is artificial, it had to have builders. And maybe that explosion event you talked about uh, 3.2 million years ago was what did in the builder's civilization. And he said, uh, you also mentioned a pole shift, which would have happened at that, right at that time of that explosion, which meant by this line of reasoning, the face had to be built before the pole shift. And uh, he said, uh, so where was the face on Mars before the pole shift? And I thought that was a very interesting question, and I understood its significance immediately. So I went to my globe of Mars, and I put my thumb on uh, Cydonia, and I put my finger on the last known position of the Mars geographic pole before the present one. And as nearly as I could rough it out by eye, it was roughly 90 degrees. So I said, well, darn, I'll have to calculate this out. So I plugged in the coordinates in the computer calculated the angle between the old pole and the present face on Mars, came out 90.1 degrees. Uh, that's an interesting angle. That means it's right on the old equator. Well, I didn't, I contained my excitement for a moment. I said, wait a minute, there's another part to this test. It also has to be upright with respect to the old equator. And I've drawn the old equator in here with the white line. And as you can see, the face is indeed quite upright with respect to it also. In fact, it's within two degrees. Uh, so both of my tests now registered artificial, if you uh, follow this line of reasoning, that it, uh, it was merely built before the last uh, catastrophe. Um, and uh, this, was, uh, this was a bit of a shock to my system because I appreciated the fact, one, that the odds were 1,000 to 1 against that being an accident, and two, that even though I was very uncomfortable going there, that the intellectually honest thing to do was to say um, uh, I was no longer justified in sitting on the fence, but had to say that there was now reason to suspect artificiality in the face on Mars such that it ought to be a priority for future imaging. Uh, and uh, several members of the Society for Planetary Study Research, SPSR, had reached that conclusion also, and they approached NASA in December 1997 and got them to agree to giving priority to re-imaging the face with the spacecraft in high resolution. This is um, the uh, computer enhanced version of the original 1976 Viking image, uh, essentially the same image I just showed you, but uh, with computers bring, used to bring out details in the shadowed side. And you can see even in this low res or medium resolution image, there is a second eye socket, and the mouth does go through. There's something uh, asymmetric over here, but the uh, uh, enclosure of, or the shape of the mesa itself is remarkably linear and symmetric. Based on the strength of this image, we made um, uh, some predictions that at the time, we really thought we were just doing pro forma. Uh, none of us considered 
took them nearly as seriously as, uh, as we uh, should have in hindsight, but we said, well, uh, if this is um, a natural object, then as we view it in higher resolution, it's going to look uh, more natural. Uh, on the other hand, if this was built to represent uh, a humanoid face, faces have more than uh, eye sockets, noses, and, uh, and a, a black line uh, under the nose for a mouth. There's more detail. Uh, there would be eyebrows over the eye socket, irises in the eye socket. The nose uh, uh, would have uh, nostrils at the end of it. Uh, the mouth would consist of separate parted lips. Uh, and so on. There are other details to the face. And uh, uh, moreover, that these secondary facial features have to occur just in the right uh, location, have the right size, the right shape, and the right orientation to be uh, obvious intents to portray what uh, secondary facial features. And nowhere else on the mesa so that you can just pick and choose the one that fits the mind's preconception of a face. Uh, that would seem like a uh, hard enough condition to meet, uh, and in fact, the odds against meeting it were enormous uh, by ch meeting it by chance. In fact, that it is in scientific method how we tell the difference between a legitimate statistic uh, or a, le uh, a finding that we have to, uh, to trust and one that merely allows us to form hypotheses to go forward. In science, we formally call this the a priori principle. It basically means what you stumble upon and see after the fact, a posteriori, doesn't count. You just use it to form hypotheses. What you predict before you have any clue what the correct answer is, is a priori. And that you have to take seriously if it comes out. So the a priori principle is that the odds of something arising by chance are significant if calculated before any evidence of its existence is known. And uh, a posteriori, the opposite, the calculated odds of something already found arising by chance uh, really apply only to the next instance. That's because lots of million to one, billion to one, even trillion to one coincidences can and do occur in nature and they're found all over the place. Accidents do happen. In fact, part of randomness includes regularity. Uh, if something uh, were claimed to be a random data set and it didn't have some regular patterns in it, it wouldn't truly be random. Um, just to, uh, to, to give one illustration I sometimes use to, uh, to bring out this point, uh, if you had a deck of uh, 52 cards and deal them out amongst four players, say, to play bridge, each player gets 13 cards. Uh, there are 13 cards in each suit. So uh, take spades, for example. If, uh, you're, uh, uh, if you've been dealt 13 cards and you pick them up and they're all spades, uh, you're going to say, wow, this is a, a very unusual hand. In fact, the odds against being dealt all sp 13 spades, uh, the only 13 in the deck, are 635 billion to one against. Um, so you say, well, uh, I just got all spades. Can I conclude then that the deck was fixed or there's been some cheating here? Um, well, maybe so. You could have your suspicions, but no, you couldn't prove that because, uh, as a matter of fact, every single deal you get of 13 unique cards, the odds against getting those particular unique cards are also 635 billion to one. And if you'd specified them in advance, that would be the odds against getting that deal. Um, uh, but uh, so every deal uh, that you get is a, is a miracle at 635 billion to one. Contrast then the, the case where uh, you pick up the hand, you see all spades, and you wonder. Versus on the other hand, let's say uh, I sit down at the table and I say, you haven't dealt those cards yet, but I predict that I'm going to get all 13 spades when I pick up my hand. Then the cards are dealt. Um, I pick up my hand and I have all 13 spades. You can be very sure that was no accident. So that's the difference between the a priori and the a posteriori. So when something is predicted in advance, uh, as these uh, secondary facial features on Mars were, 
uh, they would, can be considered significant. Uh, and the, um, the predictions were specifically eyebrow, nostrils, iris, and lips with the correct size, shape, location, and orientation. Uh, we worked out the odds against any, each of one of those occurring by accident and then combined them all together. And then, uh, except for the iris shape, a circle, uh, no similar features exist in the background that would allow us to pick and choose. So then this is the spacecraft image, the actual data uh, as it came down from the spacecraft. Now this may not bear much resemblance to images you've seen in the media, and I'll explain that difference in a moment, but this is the actual spacecraft data. Uh, now it was taken, this image was taken under very unfavorable conditions. Uh, specifically, the spacecraft was not over the mesa at all. It was w far off to the west, so it was looking at the face not quite um, edge on, but so nearly that this is more closer to a profile of half a face than of a full face. So you see that the uh, left eye socket uh, is this huge area here, and the right eye socket, we can just see the far corner. It's hidden behind the nose ridge. That's because of our very uh, slanted uh, angle viewing perspective. We're viewing from the side, not, the, not above. Uh, and the other thing is that the lighting was extremely unfavorable. Basically, the sunlight is coming from down in this direction. And uh, as you know, if you uh, hold a flashlight under your chin, uh, a human face looks rather distorted and, and uh, almost grotesque uh, when illuminated in that way. So uh, the, the lighting conditions were unfavorable to seeing the, this, uh, what might be there uh, also. Nonetheless, we were startled, startled to see that over the um, west side eye socket, there was a triangular feature that could conceivably be uh, an, uh, a sculpture's attempt to represent an eyebrow, that uh, in the uh, eye socket uh, there is a circular feature that could be an attempt to portray an iris, that at the end of the nose there are uh, two circular features that could be attempts to portray nostrils, and that the um, a mouth feature did indeed consist of parted lips. Uh, when we uh, put all this together uh, and uh, some com skilled computer graphics artists uh, worked on this and their, uh, their expertise is such that um, they were very, very careful in doing what I'm going to show you now. Um, they were very careful uh, not to do anything to this image that would in any way change the content of the image, but only change the viewer's perspective of it. So specifically, uh, the artist simply attempted to use the computer. Uh, this is a standard feature built into image processing programs such as Adobe Photoshop. Uh, any of you can purchase on the market. Um, you can change the lighting, the direction from which the lighting comes uh, for a feature, a feature, and you can change the angle at which you're viewing it. Now that requires knowing uh, three-dimensional information about the image, but we have that because we have images from the face taken at several different viewing angles. Um, so uh, this is what the, um, so the artist uh, began with a negative of the image I just showed you. And let's see. Uh, now, if I can, uh, what I'm going to do is start this animation. It's a very short animation. It'll be over before you blink an eye. Uh, this is just a, a sequence of images put together in, in an animation that show the lighting change being made step by step very quickly, and then show the reorientation of the face to an overhead viewing angle. So here it goes. There's the lighting change, and there's the adjustment to the overhead viewing angle. And this is the computer's reconstruction of what it would have looked like from that viewing angle. Now this is the re uh, image that was released to the media. Uh, it doesn't even look anything like the uh, original raw data. What happened here? Uh, well, that's a very good uh, question. Uh, fortunately, uh, 